All right, I think we are two minutes uh, past nine o'clock and we are ready to get started. So, hello everybody, welcome to OpenCV Weekly Webinar. And today we have a very exciting episode with Joseph Nelson, who is the CEO of RoboFlow. We're going to talk about, is AI smarter than a toddler? Uh, quick intro, Joseph. Yeah, happily. Hey everybody, Joseph, happy to be here this week. Um, as Satya mentioned, I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company called RoboFlow. Uh, we make computer vision developer tools, but we also run a lot of experiments to ex advance and test out state-of-the-art computer vision and machine learning technologies. Uh, and so today, we'll in introduce the challenge with a bit more specificity, but today is one of those days where we can pull back the curtain on some of our experiments and compare um, how powerful machine learning really is. That's great. And also with us is uh, Phil Nelson. And Phil is the director of content. And uh, Phil, we have, we, we just decided on a new title because Phil was doing way more than uh, what, uh, you know, uh, what the uh, previous title was. So Phil is now the director of content, but I know there was another piece to it. D director of content and creative, I think is what we came, we came up with. All right, director of content and creative. Um, so um, welcome, Phil, uh, quick introduction. Yeah, hey everybody, once again, it is I, the co-host with the co-most, the second banana who is second to none, your plus one and only Phil Nelson. And I'm here to remind you of a couple of things we do every single week here on OpenCV Weekly Webinar, one of which is our special giveaway to you in the audience. Joseph has been so kind as to volunteer a few things from RoboFlow. Would you like to tell people what they'll win if they answer our trivia question later, Joseph? Two potential prizes for two lucky winners. So one is uh, a RoboFlow swag pack. Um, which includes things like a RoboFlow water bottle, uh, kind of a raccoon backpack, uh, some super cool shades. Pretty that cool Phil sunglasses. Is, Phil is yeah. demoing for us. You can, you can get a look at the get a look at the command center here. <laughs> <laughs> um, and a number of other things. They've been quite popular, and um, we give them out to our users that build amazing projects and share them publicly, uh, and kind of contribute back to the community, as well as those that are part of today's webinar. And then the second thing that we have. Uh, for anyone in the world is sponsored of increased GPU credits uh, to train bigger, larger models completely for free um, within the RoboFlow ecosystem. Yep. Uh, thank you, Joseph. And we'll also be taking Q&A from you in the audience. So please use the Zoom Q&A button at the bottom of your screen there to ask your question at any time during the webinar, and we'll get to them as time permits. Satya? All right. So yeah, uh, this is going to be an exciting conversation. And please, uh, we want uh, we want you to ask questions, and you know we are we are going to answer uh, anything you ask in the chat. Uh, Joseph, it's your show. Awesome. I will. Uh, I'll share my screen here to get things started. Excellent. How's that look? Looks good. Awesome. So uh, the topic of the day is is machine learning smarter than a toddler? And Phil didn't make me change the subtitle, so I said it's at least smarter than Phil, uh, which uh, <laughs> is a nice nice way to kick off. The, Accurate. The, <laughs> nice way to kick things off. And I, I said it's. I didn't say the toddler or machine learning, so we'll never know. Um, <laughs> so as noted, uh, Joseph Nelson, CEO at RoboFlow. Um, I'll give a broader introduction to, to RoboFlow and then Satya uh, from OpenCV coming at you live with today's discussion. Um, I like to introduce OpenCV. I know it's your all's webinar and you feel sort of strange describing it, but it's a pretty cool opportunity to describe like the impact that OpenCV is having. So I always like to lead with this context, Satya, if you want to give us the uh, 30,000 foot view of all the what work sweetheart. You, you do. Yeah, you do. so OpenCV is uh, the biggest computer vision library in the world. Uh, it has more than 2,500 algorithms in it. And uh, uh, since the last few years, we have started growing beyond the library. We have courses now. We have OpenCVI kit with depth, which is a very powerful spatial AI camera. And we also have modelplace.ai, where we have a repository of many uh, state-of-the-art models. Uh, we do benchmarking, et cetera. And of course, we also provide consulting services. So that's uh, OpenCV today. Uh, we are growing fast and we'll, we'll see how, how it goes. And we've been doing a lot of uh, community activities like competitions, which have been very popular. Uh, so that's where we are today with OpenCV. Wonderful. 
Yeah, it's uh, been great to be a partner in, in OpenCV. A lot of folks use OpenCV and RoboFlow together. So it's always been a very nice partnership to describe and democratize access to some of the more traditional algorithms that OpenCV has powered for the last two decades. And then the transition of machine learning and um, uh, deep learning based approaches to computer vision. So uh, a little bit about RoboFlow for those that are, that are unfamiliar. Um, at RoboFlow, as I mentioned, we build tools for adding computer vision into your products faster, uh, more efficiently and uh, more accurately. So a little over 50,000 developers uh, build with RoboFlow. Um, and actually, in fact, developers from over half the Fortune 100 were fortunate to count customers like Walmart, Cardinal Health, um, the uh, Medtronic, and some other large companies, just as much as many, many, many small companies and startups that are just getting up and going and across the globe, customers from Taiwan to London to New York to San Francisco and everywhere in between. Um, we are ourselves a, a remote distributed team predominantly based in the US uh, with uh, a couple of folks in, in Canada, but so no more, mostly North America. Uh, and we predominantly build systems, as I mentioned, for developers to add vision to their products. Um, to be a bit more specific, if you're building a computer vision model, you need to ensure that you have a high quality data set and be able to collect that data effectively and easily. So we have APIs for smart data collection, identification from video and image feeds, organizing that data. So what data do I label? How do I share it with my team? How do I make sure that I'm working on the right sort of data to improve my models? Labeling of that data. So you can actually label directly in RoboFlow for object detection, classification, multi-class classification, instant segmentation. Uh, which I think is new since the last time I was around these parts of having segmentation support. Um, and then you can train models as well directly in RoboFlow. So if you want to train a model, you can use that for automatic labeling. You can use that model and host it via API. You can deploy it directly to the edge like a mobile device or an Oak device, the OpenCV AI kit. And then you can monitor the performance of that model and kind of repeat the loop because as the folks that are in the machine learning world know, it is super key, not just to deploy a model once, but continuously improve and in a lot of ways, the data is going to be changing. So having a system for continuously improving that model is, is important. Um, there's been all sorts of cool use cases that have been built with RoboFlow. Some of the ones that I like to talk about are things like uh, Wimbledon using us for like powering their instant replay. Uh, and then hobbyist uh, sort of the projects as well. Um, like, I don't know, I think some of the, uh, the one of the most recent fun hobbyist ones that, that, that I came across was if you know like the game cornhole or some people call it bags based on the regional geography, someone was using an Oak device with RoboFlow to build like an automatic like cornhole scoring device, which is just in time, right? As football season's around the corner and um, tailgates will come out and you need to automatically score your, your cornhole. So yeah, I do, do, uh, do people, do people who don't live in America know what cornhole is? I don't think they do. <laughs> I do not think they do. It's basically, I'm going to, I'm going to get a ton of hate mail for this. But I think it's a crappier version of horseshoes. I said it. I said it. Wow. <laughs> I'll be the first hate letter I, I, right here. So basically, you've got this this cardboard or this this uh this wooden plywood thing at an angle. You send you stand like ten feet apart or whatever. Is, is that what it is? And then you try to throw little bean bags into the hole in the middle. Two people per team and, and whatnot. It's it's basically crappier horseshoes. I'm I'm not taking that back. Um, anyway, continue. Really Maybe a more international relatable one was someone was making a foosball scoring model. So every time the foosball goes into the goal, they want to automatically uh, score that that, that that had happened. Um, so there's people that are doing that stuff just as much as uh, household name car manufacturers that are improving their production lines with with RoboFlow. So everything in between, it's been been really, really exciting. One thing that actually I, I should share is, um, let me come out of, out of screen share for a moment. We've actually launched something and I'll drop the, uh, the link in the chat for everyone to, to play around with. That makes it much easier to discover the public projects that many, many creative users are building with uh, with RoboFlow every single day, um, called RoboFlow Universe. So, oh, we should do that for OpenCV. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've checked it out. It's definitely. Um, uh, I get you. I get your marketing emails, obviously. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, like on on RoboFlow Universe, for example, um, if you want to do something like I don't know, let's say we're building like that tennis ball tennis ball outside project. You could go ahead and see like other users that have worked on similar projects uh, and that can accelerate your ability to build uh, models and get things up and going a bit more, a bit more quickly. Um, so this has been very, very popular. Great, and great resource if you're getting started as well. Um, you know, a lot of the teams in OpenCV Spatial AI contest, which we just announced the winners for last week, 
got a lot of help using RoboFlow for their projects. Yeah, so uh, I, I think uh, RoboFlow was the most popular uh, tool for people um, who did not, uh, who had no experience with AI. Uh, but I think it is also, it was also very popular among people who just uh, wanted a more structured platform where they could uh, easily uh, try out dif different experiments. It, it, took, it holds your hand a little bit more yeah. than yeah. some of the other systems. And also out there the data sure. is there and everything is there. So it makes it very convenient. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, our, our goal is generally to be a, a nice on ramp for folks that are um, just getting into it, just as much as having that deeper level of sophistication for folks that need to um, improve models and know what data to label and these sorts of things. But I mean, like, kind of a fun Pepsi challenge is like, I don't know if someone wants to put in the chat like a topic that they're like, huh, I wonder if someone has built a computer vision project to do blank thing. Uh, it's kind of a fun challenge. So my my project that I, I've been threatening to use RoboFlow for for a while is video game cartridge identification Ooh. and uh, labeling. So let's see what we got. Wow. That's, that's very specific. Oh, well, you got plenty of those too. Look at that. Interesting. Hmm. Oh, ooh, yeah. I like that. This one, this one actually looks like it might. I mean, these games are probably a bit more it, modern. Than... Yeah. Is it doing segmentation uh, or is it doing just detection or is it also running OCR? Because that would be incredible. This looks like, uh, yeah, there we go. Yeah, PS2 cool. it looks like. Yeah, the next step obviously would be. Uh, Ooh, some know, angle doing... bounding boxes for you and everything. Mm. Fancy. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, <laughs> great starting point. So yeah, um, anyone that's actually uh, Ritesh, I think, has been on on the webinar. He's made models with like uh, like blackjack card detection and things like yeah. that. And you can actually go ahead and use that model right out of the gate. Yes, indeed. So yeah, that's that's a bit about what's uh, made it possible and. As, as discussed, it's a developer tool. So free to get started and start using it in your projects and get live. And then um, if you're a, a private company and you're working on private data and you want to be uh, continue to be private and you want to grow out of the sandbox, then of course we have commercial offerings as well. But here's kind of the way we describe the product, everything from collect, organize, label, process to train, deploy, and, and monitor improvement. And usually folks kind of like, um, they'll either uh, kind of like get deep into some of the data set organization and maybe they want to do some of their own training uh, or there's folks that say, you know, the ease with which we can do all, all steps of this process in one place is, is very, very helpful. So that's kind of where it depends on the, the depth and experience and where someone wants to be customizable. But it's pretty um, interoperable with existing tool chains. So, yeah, it's been a lot of fun working on this. And um, what we're talking about today has little to do with the core tool chain, which is why I thought it was important to share a bit about the, the context of where this comes from. Shifting to the flavor of the day discussion. So... Today, I want to have a discussion of comparing the state of the art of machine learning versus toddlers. And that's sort of like a strange topic. Like when I messaged Phil that I thought this would be a fun thing, he was like, I, I, I don't know about that. Um, and eventually, you know, he's, he's come around and maybe to his, his dismay, we'll see. Well, how that was goes. that was after you told me that it wasn't about how many toddlers a Terminator could defeat in battle. <laughs> <laughs> I never said, <laughs> it's just never stated. Uh, and so I think that like given some context for the motivations here of why this is an interesting topic is, is helpful. I mean, for starters, you know, artificial intelligence has its roots in emulating human capability, right? If you consider the Turing test of can a model fool a human into whether that was a human motivated outcome or was a, a, a machine learning system that came up with a given outcome. Um, and benchmarking how far machine learning has come from state of the art model advances versus human intelligence is always like a fun ongoing endeavor. And I think few things are more fun than kind of comparing how models learn to like how like childhood development and like parenthood, some of these things come to life. So I think it's kind of like a fun general moment of intrigue. And in some ways kind of like philosophical of like, man, like, do these models possess consciousness? How much do they really know? Like, and these these sort of questions that uh, that that get asked. Um, I, I, I always think uh, this is an aside, but I always think that watching kids grow, it's almost evolution in the miniature. So, for example, they learn to walk first and talk later, right? So maybe it is related to evolution that we started as humans started walking first and talking later, um, I mean, there were other means of communication, but language uh, required more uh, sophistication, right? Uh, that's an aside, I just, whenever I think about toddlers and learning, that is something that comes to mind. Yeah, definitely, the, the, order, the order of learning. 
And some, some additional motivations for this. So Francois Chollet, he's the creator of Keras, the popular library that has since been merged with TensorFlow, not an April Fool's joke, actually merged with TensorFlow, um, <laughs> of, of wanting to, uh, uh, he wanted to, in 2017, he kind of had this tweet where he said, you know, there's, there's no practical path from human, or excuse me, from superhuman performance in thousands of narrow vertical tasks to the general intelligence and common sense of a toddler which I think actually tees up the discussion of machine learning versus toddlers in a really effective light because machine learning and artificial intelligence, as we know, is quite good at narrow AI tasks, right? Like you've seen systems that diagnose cancers better than like state-of-the-art doctors on very, very narrow tasks of say, here's an image of melanoma versus not. And the systems learn um, and pick up on subtleties that diagnose conditions in a superior way. And the question that I'm kind of interested in asking isn't just like maybe the narrow tasks, but like in a general sense and the idea of maybe like almost memory and zero shot capabilities. And if we just took some of these large mega models and we said, hey, I'm going to have you put you up to a given task, how well can you do compared to what a toddler might do? Um, and I think that's kind of the way that I wanted to frame the discussion today and I'll unveil some of the challenges of what we're going to compare and the models and like the, the human intelligence tasks. But I thought this was a good point for discussion of Satya, if you had thoughts about like the idea of like narrow AI and general AI and uh, kind of how these tasks all come together. Yeah. So uh, the first thing I want to say, even before uh, getting into that uh, topic is that we always compare uh, machines to humans and not just one human, we want to compare it to the best human possible, right? Or you want to ch play chess, it's not enough that you're beating 90% of the population, can you beat the best, right? So you put a very high threshold on these machines. And the second thing is that uh, you always compare machines to whether a machine can do a human task, right? So it is the human's capability that you're comparing against uh, a machine. Uh, not the other way around, right? You never say that, oh, can you actually memorize uh, a telephone book, <laughs> right? <laughs> because that's a machine's job. Machine does it very well. Humans uh, pretty much suck at it, right? Um, so it's very unfair to machines when we talk about, oh, are you as- Or like the, base, as... the baseline human is, is sort of what we're talking about, right? The, well, yeah. we, are, we are all, uh, we are, the, the assumption is that humans are smarter than, uh, than machines because we are judging machines on human tasks. But if you flip it around, if machines were to make this uh, argument, they would say that, oh, can you actually uh, memorize an address book, right? That's the task we are going to judge you on. Oh, the humans, <laughs> you, you don't perform that well, right? A toddler, adult doesn't matter, right? We beat you. Oh, you want to, uh, I want to judge you on how your, uh, not peripheral, but back vision looks like. It's zero, you cannot see behind your back. But me, a computer, I can have, you know, 360 degree view uh, with cameras. And if you judge uh, you on that task, then, you know, a machine, even a, even a mediocre object detector would do much better than, than humans, right? So that's one thing. Uh, so there the are two things, right? First of all, we judge machines on human tasks. Second thing is that we uh, we judge them compared to the best humans. So toddler is a good one because usually we judge them uh, for the best humans. Uh, so in some sense, machine learning has far surpassed toddlers uh, in certain tasks. We just don't, don't uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> judge they, them on those tasks. The machines do lag behind in adorableness, I will say this. <laughs> uh, okay, and now coming to uh, AGI versus, uh, you know, the artificial general intelligence versus, it's a very, uh, it's a very uh, controversial topic. If you, um, you know, go check out what Jan Lucken uh, has to say about it, even humans don't have general intelligence, right? There's nothing called uh, uh, general intelligence. Humans are trained for very specific tasks. They are good at very specific tasks, but they are not really generally intelligent, right? So uh, he thinks that we will get to human level intelligence, but not what we call general intelligence. So there's a bit of semantics there also. Uh, people, it's a not well-defined term what artificial ge general intelligence means. I think there's also something to be said about, uh, people talk about this online a lot, especially lately, but 
um, smart versus clever and how the, there's a, it's a subtle but very important difference. Um, you can have, there's a lot of smart machines, but there's not very many clever machines because they can't come up with stuff on their own um, without being boxed into very specific parameters. Imagination. I find, I find that a lot of these discussions do end up in like a place of semantics to, yeah. to your point of like, what, what do we consider general and, and whatnot? Now, I do have one more motivation for why I thought it'd be interesting to compare machine learning versus toddlers. And that one is, 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 a, is a personal motivation. So I um, recently, um, my, uh, one, of, one of my brothers was, um, or had their second child. And before they had their second child, they, I was proximate to them in the area. And so they said, will you come watch our first child while we go off to the hospital? And so I went over and watched um, Griffin, who's 14 months, 14 months old. And when I was taking care of him, I went through some of like the, the books for like story time and some of these things. And one of those books that we went through is, I think I might've put it out of order. Yeah, here we go. Um, one of those books was uh, called uh, First 100 Words. And so inside this, this book is basically a bunch of photos with labels for those photos of like, you know, here's like a truck, here's like grapes, here's like a tomato. And so I, of course, working in the field of computer vision and machine learning, I'm like, this is, this is just mostly a machine learning task that we've got, that we've got going on here, except uh, with, <laughs> with my nephew. And so, you know, throughout, as we're going through the story, I kind of ask him to point out some of the examples. And I say, hey, can you point out to me which one's the fire truck or which one's the grape or the tomato or these sorts of things? Um, and that got me thinking, you know, huh, if he's able to do it, at, I'm not gonna tell you how well he did yet. If he did it roughly at this level, how well would a, you know, state-of-the-art general, I'll call it, uh, at least like a large mega model do at the same sort of task? Um, and that kind of got me thinking of like, if I were to create the ultimate scorecard, ultimate, I mean, if I were to put together a few tasks of comparing, um, you know, what a general maybe toddler would be capable of compared to like what some uh, large mega models are capable of, what would the results be? And so that's, that's kind of what I did for, for today's discussion. And um, I think it's an interesting uh, conversation to be had about the state of machine learning compared to that of, you know, a 14 to, you know, 24 month old um, uh, baby as they grow up. So um, the first uh, of those, or there's three areas that I, that I think we should benchmark against uh, and take you down this road, Satya. So one is object detection and, and recognition. Um, and I'll talk more about the model and what we're going to use for that in a second. The second is drawing a picture. Uh, which I think is like a fair playing field for, for a machine and intelligence and creativity versus that of perhaps a, a toddler. And then the first is like maybe completing a text prompt or maybe like call and response, or you can consider this maybe Q and A or, or something like this, which I'll show something that we've built at, at RoboFlow that uses GPT-3 uh, for sort of a, a, a fun sort of project. So I thought, you know, we would compare against these three areas mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm not gonna necessarily render a decision. Maybe we can let the audience make a decision about what they think is the ultimate uh, conclusion of, of the, the victor or not. But I think this is kind of a fun way to, to you know, this isn't just like a, a literature review of let's go through state of the art. It's let's get our hands on and look through and play with some of these models and see what's possible and discuss and deliberate, um, you know, what goes well and what doesn't go well. So those are the three tasks that I've teed up. I don't know what, uh, what you think about it, um, but just say the word and we can start to dive in. No, that's, that's great. I think these are really good choices. Awesome. Yeah. You, again, you vetoed the fist fight that I wanted to have as number four, <laughs> but whatever. Uh, I don't think, honestly, I don't know that I have a fist fighting robot, but and that's not a challenge. Okay. So um, let's go ahead and uh, start with task number one. So actually here, I'll introduce, I'll introduce clip as, as, as task number one. So task, task number one is object detection and recognition. So the, the goal here is, um, if we say from like the baby first 100 words book, for example, which I have a bunch of examples of, of baby first 100 words here. Okay. So baby first 100 words, the various pages in this show uh, different objects. And you see these objects are pretty clearly labeled. And as you, as I thumb through this book, certainly those in the audience are like, oh, of course the machine learning guy saw this as a machine learning task. I mean, just look at this. It's just um, exactly like labeled images um, and everything. By the way, this, this specific page is very challenging for toddlers because these all, this is like describing actions of other toddlers that are uh, labeled in this way. This one, this one was a particular challenge. But yeah, it's, it's gotta be tough when you don't have any sense of self yet. <laughs> um, this this so. book is also a great example of uh, how humans um, 
suck at certain jobs, right? For example, if you ask any of your friends, uh, especially uh, the ones with kids, right? Which is the book you have read the most? They would come up with whatever their favorite book is. I've read it three times, four times, whatever. Maybe I've read it six times. But no, the right answer is that you have read your kid's book 100 times every <laughs> night. For, for, you know, what, what music have you read, uh, you know, listened to uh, X number of times? You, it would be some kid's nursery rhyme that you have probably, a uh, lullaby kind of thing that you have probably heard or, a thousand Or more times. likely these days, something from Frozen or whatnot. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> yeah that's probably true or even just keeping counts the model would probably do better if keeping counts and so so my my thought was i have this data set and you know there's a couple of different ways we could approach this task right so one of the ways we could approach this with machine learning so one of the ways we could approach this task with machine learning is we take all these images and then we we drop them like uh, we uh we crop out you know like just the ball crop out just the duckling crop out just the flower crop out just the pear and we and we drop them into a data set and we train a narrow specific object detection model, you know, use YOLO V5 or YOLO R or, you know, faster RCNN or, or one of these models and we see how well does it do. Now, you'll know if you're in the machine learning field, only having one image per each of these, that'd be relatively challenging. Um, now, one thing I'll note is that like a tool like RoboFlow, you can augment and increase the number of images. So you'd probably do a little bit, a little bit better and maybe even deliberately overfit on the, on the training data for the case of this task. But one task that we could do is train a narrow AI to recognize each of these each of these objects, and um, you know when I did that, um, it did did quite well. And I'll share and kind of showcase the uh, example example data set. Um, but the other approach I wanted to take was if we took a mega model and we say, does that mega model? When I say mega model, I mean like a very large. And I'll introduce the specific mega model in a moment. A mega model, and we use zero shot inference from that model. So in other words. Well, while one approach says, I'm going to take all these images and train a specific model on those, those examples, the other approach says, well, let's take a generally intelligent model and ask that generally intelligent model, does it have the concept of a ball, of a duckling, of a tricycle, of a rabbit? Uh, and I thought that was perhaps more representative of, of interacting with a human where you're like, hey, do you know this? Do you know that? Um, and so that's the approach that I wanted to take. Um, now, with that approach, however, um, just asking it where in this image, you'll realize that like, like if I just give the model this image and I say, you know, um, white rabbit, what I would have to challenge it to do is I would want it to crop and say, this is where I see the white rabbit in the image. And so I put together a, a collab notebook that I'll show you in a moment that goes through a two stage process to, to output this given, given task. But that's kind of the way that I thought about this. So at the highest level, it's in this given first 100 words book, toddler, ask it to ask the toddler to identify the object compared to machine that has not been trained, not a narrowly trained model, just a general model trained on lots of objects out in the world. Can you identify if I ask you, where is the blue ball on this page? So basically it's kind of like a crop challenge of here's the object, show me where on the page this object is. So that's the way that I've kind of teed this up. If we have a, a thoughts or, or questions about that. That seems like it makes sense to me. Thoughts, Satya? No, that makes perfect sense. I like that, how you have thought through this. Awesome. Yeah, but, well, thanks, because I, I can't change it now. So the, <laughs> the, uh, the model that we're going to use for like the general, the general recognition is, is CLIP. So um, what, I, what I'm going to do is um, take a uh, generic, or take just a generic uh, object detection model um, to identify objectness of like, see where you see objects that are of interest from just Coco. And then of those objectness objects, I'm going to ask Clip to say, hey, I'm gonna give you a text prompt and you're gonna tell me where in all those objects that were found, where you found the set of pixels that correspond. So basically what's gonna happen is the image is gonna go through a, a um, generically trained object detection model. That generically trained object detection model is going to spit out where it thinks there's objects on the page. So it might find the same one twice. It might find the same one a bunch of times with slightly different pixel boundaries. And then I'm going to take all of those. You can almost think about those like cards. And then I'm going to ask Clip and I'm going to say, I'm looking for the white rabbit. Where on the page is the white rabbit? Um, and what Clip is, is we talked about this in our last discussion, is it's a multimodal model that understands the relationship between images and text. And so you can kind of give these text prompts and get back image examples. 
Um, and there's another model that I have on the page here that's called Florence. That's even more advanced than, than Clip, but not generally available from, from the Microsoft research team yet. But the cool thing about Florence is that it was actually trained using images from Roboflow Universe. So researchers are advancing state of the art from images that are out in the community. They created like a basket of public data sets of 11 public data sets from Mobileflow that you can kind of see on the right of like a thermal image of our chess piece data set that's sort of all over the place, packages and these sorts of things. So that's the way that's that I- That's the best performing about. model uh, right now. Yes, that's the current state of the art. So, yeah. um, okay, so I pre-run this, this collab notebook um, and uh, you can see that I've loaded in, this is just me loading the page that you just saw from the first 100 words book. Um, so I've loaded in this, this image uh, and then I printed out the ability to see the image uh, and you can see a nice human hand there. And then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to grab uh, Yolo V5S just from Torch Hub right out of the, out of the box. Um, and I'm not going to do anything to it aside from uh, run it. Uh, and what I'm going to do is, so this is me loading uh, Yolo V5. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask it to just look for uh, anything that it might see as like objectness, like things that look objects like. Uh, from the COCO uh, data set. So this common image, common objects in context, anything that you could see that might potentially be an object, I want you to pull it out of this image. And so that's when it pulls out a bunch of these potential uh, candidates. And it says, hey, these might be some things that I see that are object E in this image. Once I have those images that kind of look object E, I'm gonna ask Clip to uh, kind of give it a description and then pare it down and say, hey, I'm looking for one specific thing. Like um, in this case, the search query, we could say, you know, a person or a flower, a pair, et cetera. And then Clip will grab from all the cards found above up here, it'll grab the one that it thinks is most similar to that text prompt. So that's what we're gonna do. I've already run this notebook once. Let's see if the kernel is still alive as I ran it just before the webinar. Um, Yeah, it looks like a tappy. So if I try, like, I say point to a green pair, and that, that's my search query. And I say, grab the top similarity to that search query. Where in the image do you see it? There you go. It found, okay. the, uh, it found the green pair on, on the page. Um, maybe I could, I don't know, what else do we want to look for here? Um, Let's say, find me the, maybe the animal. Let's say, find an animal. That'll be my search query. Does it do a bird? Let's see if it has a concept of bird. Oops. It's kind of funny. You can see like the model thinking as it processes. <laughs> oh. That's that's neat. It's pretty it's pretty impressive. Pretty yeah. good out of the gate. And um, you're using uh, pretty much off the shelf things to do this experiment. Yeah, I think that's you exactly said right. uh, Yolo five S uh, Coco. Um, what what other what other stuff is uh, Colab obviously to, to run it here. Yep, and then um, and then Clip uh, and then Clip just says it converts my my search query into the the corresponding images. Um, so far, so good. Someone says, find, find an eye. So let's see, an eye. Let's see that in the chat. Feel free to, to put suggestions out. Let's see what it thinks is most similar to an eye. Now remember, it's looking for, <laughs> it's looking for from the examples that have objectness. Yeah. It's looking from those examples, what is most similar to the text prompt. Is it just one page or all the pages? This is just one page. Oh, okay. so I thought the, interestingly, I thought the hand was most similar. Obviously, we could loop through and do all yeah. the pad pages, but yeah. given the amount of time you see one page takes to do the search, I thought we'd limit it for the time of the webinar. Makes sense. Right. Um, How about a fruit? Yeah, let's try a fruit. Um, let's see. Someone says penguins. Pen oh, yeah, it knows fruits. Let's say uh, 
penguins. Let's see what it thinks is most similar. So clearly there's no penguins here. Yeah. So, you know, I didn't get to ask my, my nephew, find the, find the penguin when there wasn't a penguin. So I don't know what the, uh, I don't know what the toddler would do with that, that prompt. That's a, that's a big problem with your uh, methods here. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta have some failures in there, some purposeful failures. Um, yeah, let's see. Uh, um, motorcycle was a suggestion. Let's do motorcycle. Let's see which of these which of these objects here is. Mo well, let's, I mean, let's not even well, let's get out. Well, of we, here's here's another one. We can ask it. Uh, why don't we ask it to find food and find out if the algorithm is vegetarian or not? <laughs> That's funny. A motorcycle. So it thinks the duckling is most similar to motorcycles. So. Let's uh, yeah. Let's say, That's the only one that is mobile. <laughs> it, it's got it's got two wheels. <laughs> I should be asking you guys to tell me what you think the answer of most. Oh similar God, is. food. <laughs> uh, this is actually yeah, kind of pushing the boundaries here. I feel like the it was uh, crunchy chicks was the oh no oh wow it's it's a cannibal well it's not a cannibal it's a robot well <laughs> we created Skynet <laughs> sorry that was our fault we we just brought on the end of the human race <laughs> darn it it's a pretty interesting outcome it's a pretty interesting outcome indeed yeah so I could get in here and change right now the threshold. If I remember correctly, the threshold of um, um, that I had saved. Uh, I believe the, I believe the phrase high. the phrase that I've heard in the past is "long pig." <laughs> long pig. Let's say let's say garden. Couple of folks are asking if you're uh, if you're planning to share the collab notebook, Joseph. Yeah, very happy to share this collab cool. notebook. Cool. We'll uh, we'll put that in the show notes as well. Awesome. So here, I actually um, when I load the model from from Torch Hub, I've got the uh, I can set the model confidence even lower so that like the number of things that are being called out here and the the objectness. Uh, it'd be even less picky, so it'd have okay. more more potential cards to sort through. Um, so I'll reload. So let's set the let's set the confidence level to like 0 0.01. And so this will pull even more stuff from that that example page that I just ran above. Oh, it looks like we got quite a few. Yeah. So so uh, to to give some context as to what's happening here, what I said is. Um, from this generically trained object detection model, um, I set model confidence very, very low. So anything that might be an object before it was set to 0.25 by default. So anything that's, you know, 25% confidence is an object is, was being found. Um, so now I said, you know, anything that you think could potentially be an object at 1% confidence, spit it out. And then we're going to have clip filter through even more noise. So the goal here is that we would get even more of these on the single page that I loaded, I just loaded this page to be clear of the color paints, the orange fish, the yellow duckling, the purple tricycle, pink flower, green pear, blue ball, black buttons, white rabbit. And so it's finding all of these options. Um, and then it'll print those out below. Uh, so there's some questions in the chat. So I should also I should also mention that um, to specifically train your low five, we also have a chat. Oh no! It looks like my kernel might have died. Okay, so I'm I'm I might just restart this and then come back to it. Um, yeah. Come back to it in a moment. Okay. Hopefully that runs happily in the background. Awesome. So we could uh, take this moment to do our giveaway. I, I'm happy to. Let's happy. Uh, we'll we'll pause here and do our giveaway at uh, it's about nine forty five. Let's do let's do let's do one of the two. Let's do one of the yeah, two. Yeah. So um, our giveaway here will be 
for U.S. folks only because it's a physical item and it's a huge pain to ship stuff uh, around the world currently, as, as some of you may, may be aware. Um, so the way this works is I'm going to ask a question that I've generated from the presentation so far, and you in the Zoom chat will answer U.S. only, Please, if you've won in the last couple of months, don't answer. Give other people a chance to win. Get ready to answer. We're using a piece of uh, software, a technology here called CLIP to build this demo. What does CLIP stand for? Go ahead and answer in the Zoom chat if you know. If you don't know, probably don't answer. It's a tough one to guess. <laughs> my kernel my kernel keeps dying so it might be the man i don't i don't see any answers here i don't think anybody knows did i finally stump them yeah. <laughs> zach's got their zach's got the right idea he's frantically googling uh, according to the chat here Corn <laughs> david suggests cornhole something okay good great great guess <laughs> Ah. All right. Looks like if somebody finally got there, uh, they, they had the fastest DNS lookup to Google, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I see uh, Matthew Schrant. Uh, congratulations, Matthew. Um, go ahead and send one email to phil at opencv.org, and we'll make sure that you get your RoboFlow swag bag, courtesy of RoboFlow. Thank you, Joseph. We've also got one more giveaway to do here, so stay tuned. Cool. So I'm going to let that kernel run. Um, in the background, hopefully, and we'll come back to it and have even more images to look at and filter filter between. That's actually why I set the. That's why I didn't want to mess with the comment threshold. I thought we might get an overloaded notebook, so we'll see if we can get more of those alive. Um, cool. So the 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 second task that um, I'll go through the second and third task relatively quickly. I don't have as as interactive of demos, but I can talk about the technologies that power them. So the second one is um, the second task to compare. Um, capabilities is drawing an image based on a text prompt. Uh, so for example, um, if you're familiar with DALI, DALI 2 recently came out from OpenAI and it's a model that uses some diffusion techniques to actually produce photorealistic images or really any images that uh, you kind of aspire to be created. Extremely high text. quality, very believable images. It, it just, they, they, for the most part, look like somebody very talented and skilled drew them. Or those images on, or whatever. Those images on the screen are from Dolly too. So a high quality photo of a monkey astronaut is the one on the left that you that you get. Um, a teddy bear on a skateboard in Times Square is the one on the right. That There's even pretty. some nice defocus blur in the background on that one too. It's very very advanced stuff. And you can tell it's a little generated, right? Because if you look at the edges of the teddy bear, that just looks a little bit off, so to speak. Um, like it's a little jagged. It's, it's and punched out a little bit oddly. And also the lighting is just kind of off because you see that kind of around the rim, the lighting is a little bit different. Um, but in general, um, the implications of, of Dolly 2 are, are, are truly incredible. Um, now, I, um, I didn't have a chance to ask Griffin to draw a high quality photo of a monkey, um, an astronaut, or a teddy bear on a skateboard in Times Square. However, there's a member of our team, uh, Jay Lowe, and I said, hey, could you give me a recent example of maybe a Jay Lowe is a member of your team? Jay Lowe? All right. Uh, J Jennifer, yeah. Jennifer Lopez? <laughs> yeah. Jen Jenny from the block? Jenny, Jenny from the block, uh, uh, also known as J-A-Y-L-O-W-E, um, okay. is a member of the team. Um, and he has a, a daughter who has uh, a toddler, and I said, hey, do you have any like kind of recent examples of things that you asked her to draw? And so he said, yeah, I asked her to draw me a pretty picture. It's beautiful. So on the right, I mean, here's where you kind of eyes in the art, you know, crit critic um, <laughs> lens. Great, of great use you... of color there. Very, it reminds me of maybe like a, like a climped. Um... So I, I, I don't know, this is where kind of, we get to art critic land, but uh, in terms of like what's smarter, I, I suppose. But um, the point here is to, 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 uh, describe that the quality of photo um, synthetic images that can be generated from the state of the art of, of Dolly is is right up there, um, and I think that now, um, and and I will I will say this: uh, the human generated uh, 
picture is, I would say, far more creative. It is uh, more imaginative and clever than the machine-generated ones, despite being, say, less consistent. And one thing that I do, I can give an example of, is um, actually showing the... Uh, so. Uh, you can actually experiment with generative models today with using, for example, um, CLIP and VQ GAN, a generative adversarial network. Um, so let me actually show some examples of that. Just real really, quick. A bunch of really good collab notebooks around that as well. Very fun to play with. Um, some pretty advanced ones that give you, you can set a, like a, a starting image and an end image. You can, you can do all sorts of, all sorts of tweaking and stuff. Um, they're, they're pretty far advanced now. Here is one of those said notebooks um, and some of the outputs of the ability to see what clip plus BQGAN can produce. We asked it to do a raccoon on a tractor and we said, start from a human drawing as an example here. So the human drawing, and then it kind of became this, uh, you know, again, I, I call it creative. Uh, you can make a more verbose prompt, a cartoon uh, raccoon driving a red tractor with big black tires in front of a blue sky and white fluffy clouds. You kind of get this like almost like a psychedelic trip uh and one of the one of the things in the prompt there is that is that pipe which uh can you you want to briefly explain what that separator does in the in the context of uh, vq uh gan yeah so um the 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 this here is the subject of what you want it to draw and then the pipe helps it recognize uh in this case we're saying stylistically another consideration that we want the model to take uh as it generates. So it, here, it basically combines them at the same, uh, at the same level, essentially, it, it treats them as equal importance. That's right. That's right. Yeah, as opposed to rendered on Unreal Engine being a part of the prior prompt, it's like, these are two equally important criteria to maximize, um, I guess, minimize loss as you produce this generative image. So I just put a link to that in, in the chat. You see a lot of cool people have figured out a lot of ways to make it uh, give the these kind of more uh, human looking or real life looking results as well, like, uh, you know, 16K art station or whatever will will because of the way the model was trained. That's right. That's right. Um, and then, I mean, uh, one final um, test is uh, comparing to GPT-3. Um, and GPT-3 is a, a, a generative text uh, model. Um, in fact, instead of going too in depth on GPT-3, um, especially given the time, I thought maybe showing a, a, a demonstration um, of some of the things that we've, showing some of the things that we've uh, created with GPT-3 would be, would be interesting. So um, at Roboflow, we created a game called paint.wtf uh, where uh, there's kind of a funny prompt and then you can, uh, you can kind of draw in a Pictionary-like interface uh, and then use clip to score how close that prompt was to the image. So what we did is we gave uh, GPT-3 10 prompts. We said, uh, the, these, these 10 at the top are actually the 10, uh, best drawing of upside down dinosaur. So we removed the words best drawing of, and that was the prompt. So upside down dinosaur, exploding pig, tattoo of a mailbox, uh, world's most fabulous monster, bumblebee that loves capitalism. We gave it I mean, these Obviously prompts. I'm the world's most fabulous monster. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if your photo's at the top, Phil. <laughs> I don't know. Spit an image. Looks just <laughs> like me. Um, and then, so then we, we after giving those 10 prompts, um, we now have um, GPT-3 automatically create uh, other prompts. So all of the prompts that you see here were actually GPT-3 generated. So a magical telephone booth, a rainbow colored otter, best drawings of a boy on a beach. Um, so all of these are examples of GPT-3 taking our creativity. A, a bald eagle with amnesia. <laughs> That's delightful. <laughs> you can get so many creative ideas for, for writing. Yeah, it's it's like that that episode of The Simpsons. You know, how do you draw amnesia? <laughs> a fireball hit in the ocean. A very comfortable pillow. An angry pelican. An oven full of brownies. Scuba gear. Business suit. Line with lipstick. Right. So, and people draw incredible, incredible things as they submit. So I highly encourage playing around with. Uh, pain is just like a fun sort of way to interact with state-of-the-art technology. I mean, um, I did a blog post on how we actually, how we made paint, which might be interesting to the, the folks that are uh, present today, um, how we built paint at WTF. So I'll drop that in the, in the chat as well. Definite shout out to Homestar Runner there in the chat. Big, big fans of uh, 
Homestar and Strong Bad over here. That's right. <laughs> Early internet days. So yeah, so they're, I, they're I don't back. know. How... They're back, by the way. Oh. So those, those are examples of, of some of the text prompts that GPT-3 can come up with when given other text prompts that are, that are pretty creative. Um, I, uh, I asked Griffin to give me some text prompts to which he responded car, which is one of the only words in his vocabulary. So I don't know how you compare that performance <laughs> to the, the GPT-3 uh, uh, performance, but text is obviously something that's pretty, pretty uh, firmly within the human um, uh, home court, if you will. So those are kind of the three tasks that I thought would be interesting and in showing you all some of the example models. I mean, we talked about the YOLO family of models. We talked about Clip. We talked about Dolly. We talked about GPT-3. Um, some things that kind of, uh, some, some parting thoughts I want to leave you with before we have the giveaway include uh, returning to Francois. Um, I want to give a shout out to Allie Miller from AWS. She was like, oh, if you're giving that talk about machine learning and toddlers, you should look at Francois' tweets because he's been tweeting a lot about as humans learn, because he recently had uh, a young child. And so you remember, we started with one of his tweets from 2017, and now we'll end with one of his tweets recently from 2021, where he says, I never cease to be amazed by the speed at which toddlers learn. During a new, doing a new thing for the first time, then instantly generalizing to infinite variations of it in an infinite number of possible situations. What's crazy about this tweet is I think you could remove the word toddlers and replace it with machine learning or replace it with Dolly 2. And you would still have an incredibly coherent, accurate tweet. So I think that's kind of a funny uh, uh, bookend to everything that we wanted to talk about. Um, I have a story really about, uh, you know, uh, humans can learn, you know, people keep saying that uh, humans can learn from a single example. Uh, for example, if you just tell a toddler, not even, so you tell that a zebra is a horse uh, with stripes, black and white stripes, right? Uh, they will know instantly what a zebra looks like. But I have this funny story. When I first came to the United States, um, uh, this was like day two, day three, right? And in India back then, 20 years back, lettuce was not something, it's not a common thing, right? People knew about uh, cabbage, but lettuce, no, they did not. So my friend, he's ordering at Subway. It is already overwhelming for him because you know you don't make your own sandwich back in India. So he finally figures out and he says that, okay, can I have some um, cabbage? And this woman who was really nice, she knew that this, this guy's fresh, fresh off the boat. She says, oh, you mean uh, lettuce? He says, no, I mean cabbage. <laughs> <laughs> I want the cabbage. <laughs> so, you know, it's not necessary that humans would learn from a, from a single example. That's great. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty, yeah, it's a great anecdote. <laughs> yeah. Guy knew what he wanted, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I guess the, the thing that I'll, I'll leave you with is a little bit about, obviously, um, we're happy to talk about state of the art and all the ways machine learning is advancing and, and those sorts of things. Um, but can't wait to see some of the things that folks create with, with RoboFlow along the way and exploring the, the RoboFlow universe. Uh, I think that one of the things we might do soon is, is a competition and probably uh, announce some of the quality of that competition and maybe even do a, a webinar and have that winners of the competition similar to the OpenCV webinar, talk about things that they've created and open data sets. And these are all ideas that I'm signing Phil up for on the webinar. So we'll see how <laughs> they pan out after the show. But um, long story short, very eager to empower all sorts of new uh, applications of machine learning, especially in computer vision, and really appreciate the, the discussion and questions today. Phil, I know you have uh, a final question to stump our audience uh, with, you. hopefully. I do. Um, yeah, go ahead and unshare your screen if you don't mind. Cool. So uh, similar to last time, um, I'm going to ask a question based on the slides and you're going to answer it in the Zoom window. This is open to anybody around the world, unless you have won within the last couple of months. And if you won earlier, please don't answer here. So get ready to answer in the Zoom window. We used a specific book to uh, compare toddlers and machine learning here. What was the title of that book? Ooh, Bob oh, Bob Shaw, quick on the draw. You got it. Uh, the answer was first 100 words. Bob, please send one email to phil at opencv.org and we'll make sure that you get your, how many RoboFlow credits were we giving away, Joseph? 10. 10. 
Awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, yeah, we've got yeah. A, we've got a couple questions here. Do, do you want any? Uh, 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 one I wanted to quickly ask uh, that you didn't go over here. Joseph, would you like to talk about uh, RoboFlow pricing a little bit, if you if you don't mind? We got we got a few questions about that during the show. Totally, totally, yeah. Um, so RoboFlow is free to get started uh, for developers, um, and from there uh, you can have. Uh, that includes the ability to upload images, manage 1,000 images, uh, 10,000 if you're on the public tier, uh, free training credits and deploy those models, and 1,000 API calls a month of those given models. Now, there's a public pricing tier and a private pricing tier. The public tier is very generous. It's hopefully our way of fostering commuter vision community. And then the private pricing tier, it depends on the amount of usage that someone needs. And obviously, we're very happy to learn about the needs and get someone set up if you're working on a, a project for, for your business. Um, but free to get started in either direction. If it's a public project, then high limits, go nuts and contribute to the computer vision community. If it's a private project, very happy to get you set up with the right limits. And uh, the best way to get started there is to go to roboflow.com slash opencv. Um, so uh, another question here. Uh, I thought this was very, we, we're not gonna be able to answer this one, I think uh, very well in the in the short time available, but I really liked this question, which was, it would be interesting to compare how much energy the toddler used to answer the question versus the machine. <laughs> um, great, great question. Um, I don't think we have a good sense of that, but I think that could be a very interesting study to perform at some point. One thing I looked into actually related to that question is the number of GPU hours it took to train these models. Um, and obviously we've, we've parallelized the training so that you don't just need to wait for one single GPU to finish. Um, and if you could, if you were not allowed to do parallel training of the model and of the operations, not only would it be, do, be a few million dollars to train this given model, but if you had to do it with just one of the highest grade tier NVIDIA GPU, it would be decades. So I think that if you want to compare the, like what a human is absorbing now, of course, the other thing to question is like, well, how many neurons and parameters in the model versus how many neurons and parameters in the brain. But I did go down that rabbit hole thinking about like. Uh, the amount of time and learning and experiencing of the world and how, you know, we're kind of like, maybe that's, the, that maybe that gives an idea to like a classroom of toddlers is maybe a more fair comparison because we have a, a, a classroom of, of models that have learned. But um, I did think about this question. <laughs> that's, that's really, that's really, yeah. Uh, we could do a, probably a whole other webinar just about that one question. It's uh, it's almost philosophical. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, we're, we're past the hour. Uh, Satya, you want to take us home? Yeah, thank you so much, Joseph, once again. Uh, it's always a pleasure to see you on the webinar. And this one was fantastic. Uh, it's, uh, I love the notebook and it's, uh, you know, great, great discussion. And uh, people saw something new. Uh, we haven't had this kind of discussion before. So thank you so much. Very interesting talk today. And uh, Phil, as always, thanks for organizing this. And our rest the audience our audience thanks a lot for joining us it means a lot to us uh for you to come here and uh, you know be in this live session so we'll see you next week again thank you so much you know that uh that 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 uh scene from the office space where uh, the two bobs come in so yep. I, I feel that I'm in, I'm I'm across the table from the two Nelsons. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, shit, three. If you look at the picture behind Joseph, there, it really. Yeah. Put on your glasses, dude. You, we gotta we gotta show people this. Okay, okay. I have to get some context here. I'm I'm um, in Miami for a a team on site, and the hotel room that I'm in naturally has this artwork. I've tried to remove it. It's. It's bolted to the wall. <laughs> it's there. And it really does look like you. Unfortunately, it looks a lot like me. So it looks like I have art of myself <laughs> in a more sophisticated way on the wall behind me. And it gets worse. I, uh, I also have glasses that um, I don't regularly wear. But when I put them on, I transform <laughs> into this man on the wow. wall behind me. It's just... <laughs>